Ever since I was a little kid, I've been obsessed with the idea of extraterrestrial life in outer space. It's like it was born in me. To me, it's not about belief at all. It's about the truth, and it's about being open to all of the different hypotheses, all of the different data, and just trying to learn as much as we can. I've always been interested in UFOs, and it's just sort of been a lifelong obsession. When I became a MUFON field investigator and I started investigating the phenomena for myself, it was like a fish to water. It was what I was meant to do, what I was born to do. I, I view it as a mystery. I think it's ridiculous to think that there's not other life out there. I like investigating things. It's just in my nature. So it, this is all coming out soon. You can't ever talk about this. You know the old saying, I want to believe. That's me. Here we are with Jeff Krause. Outside of the MUFON headquarters here in Newport Beach. We made it. In one piece. Two pieces. One, two. Uh, I think that MUFON's creed says it all. Uh, the scientific investigation of UFOs for the benefit of humanity. Well, it's the Mutual UFO Network. They take in reports of sightings and experiences and put it all together and sort of research the entire subject. MUFON uh, started out as a Midwestern UFO network. 1969, when Project Blue Book, the Air Force's official uh, investigation into, into UFOs closed. That's when MUFON became the Mutual UFO Network. And we've been doing the Air Force's job ever since. And it's a private group, we're all volunteers. And I've got a little team of eight people that work you know, under me at MUFON. Specifically, I'm interested in astrobiology, which is the search for life on other planets. Um, now, interestingly enough, most people who are in the field of astrobiology would not necessarily be interviewed on a UFO documentary. Mostly, we do this out of love for the phenomenon and just a quest for understanding this phenomenon. Uh, the way I will do a UFO investigation, uh, if it's through MUFON, I'll, I'll have a report come in. People will, you know, if you see a UFO, you don't want to call the Air Force or the police or, you know, <laughs> uh, I mean, you could, but usually they'll shuffle that under the doormat. But if you go to MUFON.com, it'll say report a UFO. You click on that and it'll ask you questions. Uh, what area of the sky you saw it in, what time of day or evening it was. Uh, they'll want to know where you were at, you know, what your city was. I'll, I'll first send the, the witness a, an email, tell them who I am and that I'm responding to their MUFON report and find out a good time when we can talk on the phone and schedule an interview with them. Part of it is a bit of a, a hunger. I, I, okay, I gotta figure out what this is. I'm, I'm gonna do my best to research and find it out. I'm gonna go through uh, newspaper reports. I'm gonna search the internet for citing reports from other organizations or from, you know, even social media, anything like that. I'm gonna do everything I can. I'm gonna look at local flight paths. I'm gonna look at everything I possibly can find to try to determine what it might have been. If more people see the same thing, then that's good too, especially because you have more perspectives to go off of. And you can find it which details match in every account. When I start to get that going where I, I'm not sure what it is yet, and so that sort of feeds itself. The more exciting it is, the more work I have to do. And then there comes that moment when I, I can't say, and I sit on it for a while. It, it, it bothers me, it eats away at me, because I don't want to close that report. I don't want to tell that, that witness, and I don't want to tell the other you know, people in the organization, for sure, that's an unknown. I sit on it and I worry on it for a while. And I, I think I'm like, and I, I'll leave it, and I'll come back to it the next day. I'm like, no, I, I, I gotta know what this is. Like, I gotta say what it is or what it's not. And that gets even more exciting, but it's also nerve wracking. Okay, if, it's, if somebody has 
just a UFO sighting, just, right? Like, I mean, it's always a huge thing when you see a UFO. If it, it depends on how distant it is. If it's something that was really in the distance, then it's just like a visual thing. And, and you know, it's, it's like if you saw anything else in the distance. But sometimes when somebody sees a UFO in the distance, a weird thing happens. It seems like this telepathic connection happens. Suddenly the UFO is right on them. And usually the last thing I do is before I close the case, I contact um, the state director and our chief state investigator, and I say, hey guys, I think I might have something here. Would you look at what I've got? Look at my notes, look at my report, and, and tell me what you think. In my mind, the holy grail of UFO investigation would be if you could actually get some kind of a material fragment from the UFO, an artifact. That's assuming that they are physical objects, but let's say that they are for a second. If you could get an actual piece of one, that would be a game changer. Because then you could take it to a lab, you could look at its isotope ratios, you could look at what elements it's made out of, and uh, you know, you could see if it matches what we know could come from the Earth. And that would tell you something pretty substantial about where these things are actually from or what their origin is. It's fun. It's exciting. A lot of the basic day-to-day -day investigations can easily be done by remote. Phone, uh, video chat, email, that kind of thing. Depends on the type of report it is. Your basic day-to-day, -day, hey, I saw something weird. I can do that over the phone. I can conduct an interview and I can, I can go through the investigation that way. Um, I'll research the locations, go through, uh, look at the air traffic in the area, check news reports, everything that corresponds on the date of the sighting, just so I can get an idea of what that person did or did not see or what, what may or may not have happened. As the type of sightings level up, those would merit an in-person investigation, say, to investigate an actual landing site or a face-to-face -face interview with somebody who's actually had a face-to-face -face experience with something else all the way up to MUFON has a division that does underwater research with trained scuba divers. They have a 24-hour response team. So, you know, if there's another Roswell incident, we can have people out there within 24 hours on the ground. Well, I think the public would be surprised to find out there's quite a few scientists, ex-military, police officers, a lot of very highly credentialed people um, involved in MUFON but there's also housewives, uh, just anybody who's interested who wants to help. I think it helps if you're a pure skeptic, that's not good. If you're a, like everybody is space brothers and everything's a UFO, that's, that's not good either. You know, you have to be able to look at stuff and try to be skeptical and, and try to figure out what prosaic thing that object might be or what the person saw and what it might have been that's other than a UFO. And it's almost like you check everything off and you just keep on, and, and, but at the end of the day, if I can't find a scientific explanation for that, you know, sighting, uh, there's your UFO. It doesn't mean that it's from an alien planet. I mean, it might be a black project of our own that uh, I'm not aware of yet, but it's still unidentified and uh, that is what a UFO is, an un unidentified flying object. It's pretty easy, actually. You can go to MUFON's website and you can read up on them and see what they're all about. You can become a member. Um, there's a little membership fee and you get a newsletter and there's, there's different levels of membership. After a couple of years, I decided I wanted to get more involved and I applied to be an investigator. And there's a whole training process to that. You sign up, you do the training, uh, you take tests and eventually you get certified as a field investigator. But that's pretty much how we do it. We have uh, generally three months limit to how long we can take on a case. I had somebody, you know, put in a UFO report that was a rocket launch from Vandenberg the other night. He just happened to be in a boat off of Catalina Island and it looked really strange. And, you know, the SpaceX launches do look strange. You know, now the, the whole you know, bottom stage will go and land back on the landing platform. And so you've got all kinds of activity and you can see that all in the sky. I, 
I can understand why this person thought it was a UFO. I wrote the guy a really nice email and told him what it was he saw. But I said, if you want, you can still talk. We, we can talk. Just let me know. Send me an email back and I'll, you know, explain it a little better to you. But, you know, we knew about this rocket launch and we were expecting people to report it. The vast majority of the people I've spoken to are excited about it. They want to know, like, what was it? What did I see? What is it? Did anybody else see it? They want to, what did you think it was? I've talked to a couple people who were just thrilled that they even had the opportunity, that, that the thing happened to them, that they saw this or, or that they, they had this contact. Some people do ask me directly, what was this? Because they feel like when they speak to me, they speak to someone from MUFON, they think we're the experts, we should know. But we don't always know. And that's kind of the point. We don't know. We want to know. We're trying to gather enough information from all these different sources, from all these different reports, so that we can say, it is this, or it is this. We can't always say that. My favorite reports are the ones that we classify as unknowns. An unknown is basically when you cannot definitively say what it was or was not. You know, there's a situation where somebody saw something, and maybe they might even have photographs, and you can, within a certain percentage of, of, of reasonable doubt, say, that was an airplane of some kind. I can't tell you what kind it was, I can't identify it, but it was a man-made vehicle of some sort, or it was a satellite, or it was whatever, a planet, a star. That's one thing. An unknown is where you can't say for sure. I can say I'm looking at this picture and that could be an airplane? That's my favorite. Those to me are the most exciting ones because it really makes you think you have to really do the research, you have to talk to the people, you have to look into all parts of it, and you really have to be sure you cannot say what it is or is not. Um, they're probably the more rare cases um, that we get, but for me, they're the most exciting ones. They're the ones that keep me interested. Yeah, a lot of them could be secret craft or, you know, atmospheric plasma phenomenon or... Um or misperceptions, again, most of them are. But there are still those cases where you have something flying in really aerodynamically bizarre ways, right? It's suddenly stopping at some insane G-force. It's reversing direction. I do my best to not... I don't want to burst someone's bubble. If someone really believes hard they saw something and they're excited about it, I don't want to break up that for them. I will do my best to explain that I can't say for sure what that is. I can't tell you that, that is a, uh, an alien or a UFO or whatever. I can only say what I think it might be or what it wasn't. The answer is that in most cases you can't ever know that anything is for sure. But what you can do is you can at least try to rule out any conventional explanation. There's times where I absolutely have to say, yeah, it's balloons, man, I'm sorry. Uh, there was a birthday party down the street and those are balloons that got away. And I try to make that as easy as possible. For me, it's not a matter of disappointment. I'm there to just figure out, to my best ability, what it is or what it is not. You know, there's a lot of different ideas out there about um, what UFOs could be classified technology from this country or that country, drones, could they be just sort of people misperceiving things? Well, yeah, they are most of the time. Could they be some kind of new atmospheric phenomenon? Could it be some kind of a plasma, like ball lightning or something? Could it be um, extraterrestrial? I would say something like 98% of UFO sightings have a completely prosaic explanation and are completely explainable as people misperceiving things and optical illusions. To sift out the minority of UFO reports that are interesting from the majority that are just sort of people seeing the International Space Station, what you really have to do is go in, look for every explanation, and rule it out one by one. It's really all about skepticism in a lot of ways. Um, and if you can't debunk it, then by definition it's a UFO. So it's one thing that I would say a lot of people kind of mistake. A UFO isn't just an unidentified, or UAP, it's not just an unidentified flying object or unexplained aerial phenomenon. 
It's something that's unidentified or unexplained after you've done everything in your power to explain it. Does that mean it's necessarily aliens? I know what I want it to be. I want it to be a uh, contact from other planets, from other civilizations. That's what I really want it to be. I think it's ridiculous to think that there's not other life out there. There's this idea that they call the Fermi paradox, which is like this sort of statement in astronomy of like, where is everyone? Where are all of the aliens if there's so many stars out there that could host life and so forth? Classic argument against UFOs being alien is it's too, stars are too far away. It takes too much energy to get here from another star system. And so how are they doing that? Why are they doing that? How could they possibly have enough time to do that anyway? Because it's just really, and it is true, stars are really far away. Take the Voyager, uh, which is the furthest thing we've ever sent out of the solar system, something like 50,000 years to leave the solar system. The other side of it is that space is very big. It's also very, 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 very old. So if you took the age of the universe and put it, scaled it down to a calendar year, all of human history happened in the last 60 seconds of January 31st. Yes, there's the stars very far away, and it would take a very long time, but there has been enough time. So let's say an alien civilization wanted to spread out throughout the galaxy, right? The way they would do it is they would send out one craft to a neighboring star system. It would get there, it would arrive in the equivalent of the asteroid belt or whatever, it consume some matter, and then it would maybe 3D print out uh, daughter probes and send those every which way to different solar systems and keep doing that. Now, you'd get kind of this snowball effect where within a few million years, you could blanket the entire galaxy with probes. And it's possible to do it in a time scale that is much, much less than the age of the galaxy, which is some, somewhere around 10 billion years old. Is it kind of crazy if they're driving their spaceship from Zeta Reticuli every Monday to go hover over Billy Bob's farm? Sure it is. But it's not ludicrous to say that their probes um, could have passed through the solar system you know, waves of traffic from that kind of colonization scenario could be in the solar system. They're, they could be hiding somewhere in the asteroid belt or the Kuiper belt, the edge of the solar system, wherever. And maybe if they are, they periodically send their probes to observe the Earth. And that is within physics, within astronomy, within astrobiology, a completely reasonable thing to speculate about, and it's completely possible. When I was five years old, my mom did disclosure for me. Now, it wasn't a family secret. We all knew that mom worked as one of Howard Hughes's two private personal secretaries. But when I was five, for whatever reason, my mom got talkative and she just told me about what she, about a story about what she had gone through that when she was working for Hughes, that uh, they, they took her out to, this, to the middle of nowhere. She said it was a great American desert. She had a little security detail with them and there was this bunker, this shack, is the way that she put it, a shack, and made out of concrete and kind of low slung to the ground and it looked like nothing. She said that she wondered why they were taking her out to where it looked like maybe they kept tools or, you know, machinery or something. But they opened up the door as everything's locked and secured and there was an elevator. So she got into the elevator with a couple of security guys and she thought that it was going to go down a couple of floors, but it kept going down. And she said it just kept going and it seemed to have a bit of speed to it and she felt butterflies in her stomach. But when it finally stopped moving, she said that the doors opened up and there was a little city there under the desert. Uh, she said that they had this one, that they had little cafes and places where you could get food and movie theaters and bowling alley. And uh, she talked about how it was funny, there was this one cafe that had these yellow umbrellas 
over all the little tables, like a French cafe. And she seemed to get a kick out of the fact that they had umbrellas in a cave. But it is apparently to make people feel comfortable with their surroundings. My mom uh, said that there were a lot of German rocket scientists that worked down there. Now I tried, to, I would ask my mom, well, what were you guys working on down there? And she would never answer that question. I have, I still don't know. I, I still have no idea. In my investigations, there was one guy who was a RAF pilot whose mom was another secretary for Hughes, and she told him the same story. I heard this from a friend of his. She was more detailed when she talked about the lab. She said that it was Howard Hughes's lab. They had a little catwalk that went over everything so you could see what they were working on down there. It was quite a uh, quite elaborate setup. It was like something out of James Bond, but real. I would say that I was always really fascinated by just the question of other life in the universe. I grew up very into science fiction. Basically just my young imagination kind of got captured by this idea of other life out there in the universe. And could we find it? What would happen if we made first contact? The first time I really heard her talk about it, and she would kind of say in general, well, we're not alone. We're not alone in the universe. There's too many stars, too many planets, it's impossible. So she, she didn't say that she had learned that anywhere exotic. There was one incident where my cousins were out visiting and my aunt brought a copy of Look magazine and it had the Betty and Barney Hill story on the cover. And while my aunt was very skeptical about the Betty and Barney Hill case, she was you know, saying that, well, how would this happen and how wouldn't everybody else have seen this? You know, a spaceship coming down, wouldn't, have the, wouldn't the Air Force have known about it and blah, blah, blah. And my mom said to her, from what I know, what I've learned, this could very well have actually happened. We aren't alone and, and the government knows this. And my aunt at that point said, oh, well, it's, this is crazy. It's like a bad science fiction film. It says that they stuck a, a needle into her navel. That was the first time I heard my mom say that, you know, that this was a real thing, that UFOs were real and that the phenomena, there was something to it. When I was very little, I thought I was being visited by monsters or devils or something when I was a little kid. The whole like frozen in place thing, the bed lifting off the ground, things in the room moving, weird sounds, but footsteps, things like that. Being frozen in place and, and I have very specific memories of things like the bed being lifted off the ground and actually being tilted so to sort of slide me out the end of the bed, that kind of thing. Because I'd been into UFOs and things like that, I started thinking that's what it was. A little bit later on, jump forward um, into the 90s a bit, you know, and there's a thing called the internet now. I mean, I was reading on a news group um, about UFO abductions because I was kind of feeling like that was what was going on. I was pretty convinced at the time. And then I found out about a thing called sleep paralysis, where you are essentially between sleep states. Your body is shut down, but your mind is still moving. Your eyes are even open, giving you the sensation of being frozen in place and almost hallucinating while you're doing it. So a lot of people will report hearing footsteps, seeing shadows around the room, um, activity just outside of the periphery, just outside of your vision. Turns out I've had it chronically my entire life, um, which isn't as common. And that's what I was experiencing. But that did feed directly into my interest in UFOs. I've talked to people who have had genuine abduction situations. That's not what I was experiencing. A lot of people think they're being abducted and it turns out to be sleep paralysis. And I think sometimes people maybe are being abducted and everyone tells them it's sleep paralysis when it's not. It's kind of a gray area. But that fed into my interest. Um, it got me deep into it because I got, wanted to research all about it up until I figured out what, what this condition was. So this happened uh, back in 2017. I was taking uh, astronomy at the local community college. We had been observing the moon for a really long time, mapping craters and so forth. So I was trying to get the telescope trained on the Orion Nebula. And then I heard this group of people behind me, the, the other, uh, another group on a different telescope, freaking out about some object in the sky. 
they're going like, holy shit, what is that thing? What? So, you know, I was like, okay, well, you, you know, the moon and the Orion Nebula are going to be here for a few billion more years. I'm going to have plenty of other chances to look at those. This thing might not be here for another second. I better go see what it is. I walk over to where they, they're all pointing and I'm standing there. And what it was, it was this V-shaped object. It was gunmetal black. And there were four big circular white lights down either arm of the V. Um, sort of like what was seen um, in the 1997 Phoenix Lights incident, if you know that one. And it was just drifting along really, really slowly. Um, one of the other witnesses said looked like it was going something like 15 miles per hour. Really low. Really, really, really low. It was started maybe level with the treetops, never got above about a thousand feet, I would say. It was pretty big in the night sky. I would say it was comparable to um, if you've ever seen the full moon. And it just kept on going and kept on going and kept on going. And then after about 20-ish seconds, it kind of got to a point. And so this is where my account diverges with the other witnesses. So I remember seeing something a little bit different from the other people that were there. What I distinctly remembered is when it got to the point where it stopped, it looked to me almost like it faded into the rest of the sky. The best way I could describe it is it was like the borders, these, these edges of this V-shaped craft were very sharp, very distinct. And it was kind of like the borders looked to me like they were getting almost fuzzier and fuzzier until the structure kind of faded into the rest of the sky. That's what I remember. Now the other witnesses only, the other witnesses remember it differently. They remember just seeing it trail off until they couldn't see it anymore. Um, so they didn't see it cloaking. What I'll say about that is that no two people are gonna remember the, an event the same way. So if I see a car crash, I'll say it was a, a red Honda or something. And you might say it was a, orange Lamborghini and that's an extreme example but everyone remember ever details of any remembered eyewitness account are going to differ in certain ways but we all agreed that it was there we all agreed that it happened there were three other people so I was like okay well I saw something weird didn't get a video I'm kind of annoyed about that you know it was, especially as a scientific sort of person I like to have evidence for things so I said to myself, okay, I want to investigate this. I want to figure out what, what, what I saw. And I want to see if I can get to the bottom of it. The way that I became a, a MUFON field investigator is, is it was after my mom passed away. I started just voraciously reading the literature out there. You know, I, before when my mom was alive, there was always that chance that she might give me that golden ticket and finally, you know, just tell me outright everything, you know, and there's no chance of that now. I just kept on reading and watching shows and finally realized, you know, I'm no better off now than I was before. I, you know, I, I don't know who to believe and, and what's true and what's bogus and what. Around 2014 or 15, Hainer One TV show came on, which was the MUFON produced UFO show. And it was a cut above everything else that was out there. It was you know, from case files. By watching that show, I finally decided I want to do this. I want to go and investigate my own cases. And that way I'm not reading about somebody else, you know, the investigation they did. I'm not questioning the veracity of these reports. It's, it's feet on the ground, you know, and, and, and it's me doing it. But I found my state director, who is Jeff Krause at that time, and uh, he told me, you know, just if you go to MUFON.com, it'll say, become a MUFON field investigator. Just click on that. It'll give you all the information. And technically, you know, you get the field investigator's handbook, which is excellent document, uh, very professional, based on Dr. J. Allen Hynek's work and Valet, you know, Jacques Valet's work, and just these many, you know, 50, four years now that MUFON has been doing this. So I studied the book and then you take a test. Uh, they do a background check on you and stuff because you don't want, you know, 
serial killers and stuff doing this. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the next thing you know, I was a field investigator. I started getting cases. You know, they'll, a, a case will come in and the state director will assign those cases. That, that's what I do now is I'll assign the cases to other, my, my field investigator team. Uh, and once in a while, I'll see one that seems like it has my name on it. I feel an affinity for, and once in a while, I'll grab, I'll grab one for myself now, still, because, you know, I mean, you're either a field, you're either an invest, a UFO investigator, or you're not, right? So I, I always have current cases going, but I share the wealth now. We don't have very many confirmed cases where I could actually take a piece of a UFO into a lab and study it. But but what we do have is a lot of evidence of them affecting the environment around them. So we have evidence of them bouncing radar waves off of themselves. Um, we have evidence of them having heat signatures that can be picked up on infrared camera. Uh, there is definitely a, a, a great interest in our military capabilities by our visitors. This is why we see things like uh, my friend Robert Salas, for instance, who was uh, the commander of, of an ICBM base in Montana back in 1968. Uh, they had a UFO that was hovering right over the missile base. Uh, the little guy in the guard shack is calling down. Everybody sees this thing. Each missile went offline. Boom, 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 boom. And then they went back online. Boom, 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 boom. It's like, this is what we can do. Yeah, you can build these things, you can aim them at each other, but you're not in control of what finally really actually happens to them. We have final word on that. And I think it was a show of power. It was also showing us, I mean, that this is a repeating thing that people hear in alien encounters, is that you know nuclear weapons are, are evil, that they will destroy humanity. People are left with with visions and, and, and dreams after, after having a contact experience of, of this desolation, like the book of Revelation, you know, but, but we brought it upon ourselves, is what people are always told, that this is your future if you're not careful. Uh, I heard from one interesting person recently who told me Mars isn't so much for colonization as it is a learning tool for you guys. This is what you will become if you don't change your ways. We're now at an age where data is finally being released about this stuff. Tic Tac stuff, yeah, the USS Nimitz, all of those. Um, you had multiple eyewitnesses and honestly, that's nothing new. That's been in the UFO literature for decades. The point is that now, the only difference now is that um, it's being talked about a lot more in the mainstream. And so now even NASA is openly getting involved in investigating UFOs. That was uh, something that was announced just like three weeks ago. Well, I know there's been a string of sightings over the years of uh, military pilots seeing strange objects flying around the, while they're up in the air and not just visual, but also being picked up on radar. The pilots are picking it up and the radar towers and the bases are picking up as well and there's plenty of audio recordings of the pilots talking back and forth and describing the settings as they're seeing them. Uh, seems like a lot of them are taking place over the water, over our coasts, um, and there's a whole theory on aquatic UFOs. I find it very interesting that the military is finally acknowledging this and releasing it. Best evidence I've heard of up till now. I would say I would hearken back to what everyone kind of talks about, which is the Tic Tac incident um, as far as the Tic Tac and, and the way that the government, uh, I think that they were very, very, very foot draggy about it. I mean, they, this event happened in 2004, and it wasn't until 2017 that it became public knowledge. A video got out, and there's nothing that they could say about that video. It wasn't supposed to get out. It went out privately on the sly. And one of the pilots, you know, he more or less videoed his, his radar screen he, or, or his FLIR video screen of what they were seeing. And there you see this craft that's just doing things that are impossible for anything that we have to do. Yeah, there was no visible means of propulsion, which is really weird. Um, really, really weird. 
I mean, that, that shouldn't be possible with what we know. No visible means of propulsion and being able to do those maneuvers. Um, and being able to, I mean, if you think about it right, from a physics standpoint, if you're in a really fast moving thing that's going at thousands of Gs and suddenly stopping, um, you would be turned to paste because, you know, if you've ever been in a car that suddenly stops, you know, the inertia is a thing. You would be thrown to the wall of the thing really, really hard. Somehow, that's not happening um, to whatever is piloting these things, unless there is no pilot. Um, I think the likeliest version of the extraterrestrial hypothesis, from what I know, is that they might be machines, probes. So I think that the government was kind of forced to acknowledge that yes, it's a thing, and it opened up the whole can of worms. At one point, I think the original footage had been leaked out, and then a little while later, the military officially released it. That's an amazing step. That's a huge step compared to the last, let's say, 60, 70 years, where they just say, no, no, it's nothing. We don't know anything. We don't research that stuff. Turns out they have been researching it all along. They've been keeping tabs on this stuff from day one. And I think that they were afraid that if they put if they put stuff out to the public, you're also putting it out to our enemies. You're putting it out to, to other, you know, other foreign nationals that might not have uh, our self-interest in mind. So I can see why they're foot draggy about it. I'm see I can see why they didn't want that information out there, uh, but it's about time. And I think these Tic Tac sightings are a huge step in that direction to getting um, what we call disclosure. The government saying, yes, here's what we know. Here's what we've got on file for all of this stuff. And they bleed it out a little bit at a time to us, but I think there's a lot more they're not saying. I know there's a lot more they're not saying. Cases where you have multiple sensors that are all picking these things up. So it's not just eyewitnesses, but it's all of these sort of things that are designed to monitor the sky, you know, because the thing is, a delusion, a hallucination, can't bounce radar waves off of it. And it can't show up on an infrared camera. Uh, especially near air bases or anywhere where they have nuclear weapons, anything of that sort, sort of high security areas, they, they tend to see that a lot more um, near, traditionally through near missile silos and things like that. Um, there's been plenty of cases of anything from just strange lights to there's been historical cases of having alarms and, and things being set off, um, or even triggering uh, launch sequences. And there's even been reports of just, not military necessarily, but NASA test rockets, test flights, being messed with. Seeing lights and seeing things moving around the launch site and having the launch being shut down. No, oh, we didn't do it? What keeps shutting this off? What keeps, you know, breaking? But nobody could figure out what it was, except that it lined up with these weird lights and these sightings at the time. It's very difficult, I would say. It's very difficult to do that with the, at least the physics that we have. But that's what makes them interesting, right? So the analogy that I would make is if, if these are alien, they are interstellar um, in origin, then um, it's kind of like the level of technology that you would need to do what I just described, colonize the whole galaxy, possible, but very advanced. Advanced enough, in fact, that I would hearken back to uh, Arthur C. Clarke's old quote, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. It would be a little bit like magic in the sense that, uh, you know, if you sent a nuclear reactor back to Victoria and England, that would really be magic to them, you know, because they, they don't understand that would have been before Marie Curie sort of figured out radium and figured out you know, it, it, would, it wouldn't make any sense. One signifier of extraterrestrial technology that got here from another star system should be that it doesn't make sense to us. It shouldn't make sense to us. I mean, yeah, I mean, there's some stuff I don't necessarily like to say or talk about just because I don't like to give definitive answers. And I also like, with cases I've personally worked, I don't like to talk too much about it because these are private citizens that may or may not have said, hey, you can talk about this or you can't. Sure. When you file a report, there is a box that says, do you want to remain anonymous? Do you 
want to keep this stuff quiet or do you care? There's a thing for that. I just assume, even if they don't care, I, it's, I don't like to say that, oh, this lady from this specific town on this specific day saw this thing. Because people will put two and two together. They'll figure out that that was Mary Jane who lived in, you know, Las Vegas. And she's, a, they'll figure that out. And maybe that person doesn't want anybody to know about it. So I tend to shy away from giving too much detail on, you know, actual real cases I've worked personally. Yeah, there's a few different reasons. Um, the subject was stigmatized, but it was more stigmatized from the standpoint of... Um, most of the scientists involved in the search for life obviously would tell you, yeah, there's probably life out there or else they wouldn't be spending their careers on it, right? But they, the idea was, you know, um, it's very difficult for... Interstellar travel is really hard. And why would the aliens come here to just sort of show up and hover over some dude's farm in Kentucky and uh, abduct a few cattle. Or you, you, you've heard the old stereotype about UFOs. Absolutely. You you know, you know about it. And so that was a big part of it. I think another thing is that um, UFOs are a very difficult thing to study with the scientific method because you can't predict when a UFO is going to show up. So if I wanted to observe a star, let's say, I could train my telescope on it and I know that that star is going to be there tomorrow, so I can train my telescope on it again. So I can reproduce whatever I find. UFOs, you don't know when one's going to show up. You can't set up an observation station and experiment and everything because it's not, it's completely unpredictable. It's very difficult to sort of get repeated tests. This is one case that's just kind of a really interesting straight-ahead UFO case. MUFON case number 95355 kind of blows me away, and I, I do, you know, keep in touch with the main witness. Witness and two friends were on a weekend camping fishing trip at Lake Silverwood near Big Bear. Uh, driving in a rural area, the witness observed a bright amber light that was flying silently and low in the distance. Uh, the object, he noticed that the object didn't have proper FAA lights on it. So the witness pulled his truck over to the shoulder and all three witnesses got out of the truck. They were all leaning up against the bumper of the truck watching as the object slowly approached their position. As the object approached, it resolved into an object which the witness described as a black boomerang wedge-like shape like a giant pair of wraparound sunglasses. By the way, I'll mention that the main witness of this case is an aerospace engineer working for a major aerospace company. All three witnesses could hear a low humming sound. We could feel it in our bones, in our feet. It was quite uncomfortable. Uh, the witness's friend said that he made sure the truck engine was turned off as he had heard that UFOs can cause car electrical problems and cause an electrical system to, to burn out. And that's true. We, we've seen that from case to case. The witness states that the object had four visible decks on either side facing him that he could actually see backlit silhouettes of either people or possibly beings standing or walking on four louvered decks which were visible behind a giant window or what looked like a giant window which encased the front of the craft. I'm guessing it was some kind of a forest field or some material that we don't, or don't know about. As the object passed over the witness he could see four panels on the back which had the look of electronic snow like you see on, a te on an old television set that's between channels. And I I've heard this in other cases too where there's a propulsion system seen and it looks almost like the snow that you'll see on a television. The witness states that the craft continued heading on its original trajectory until it was finally lost to their sight at the visual vanishing point. Now the witness who was on the camping trip with his friends, uh, he worked as a lab technician doing electroplating of circuitry boards that were used exclusively in aerospace uh, work. Guy is sharp as a tack, uh, no reason to make this story up. Here's some of his interview. He said, I've never seen anything like what we witnessed that Sunday. We all saw it. My best friend who passed away last year was there as well. He didn't want to report this even though we did know about MUFON when we had our sighting. 
But John recently passed away, which freed me up to finally put in a sighting report about this. I don't know if it's ours or if it's theirs, but I'm hoping that you can help me because it looked like a flying aircraft carrier. Uh, I interviewed the witness. It says here, you know, I, I interviewed him thoroughly uh, three times over four months. A witness never changed his story, never embellished on what he had said. What I'll do when I speak with somebody, like in this case, uh, there was only one main witness left. So I'll, I'll kind of cold call the person and have them repeat so that, you know, you, you know if somebody's reading from a piece of paper or if they're embellishing or making something up or if they're telling you something from memory. Uh, this guy had just all the emotions that you would have if you had seen something amazing like that. Uh, he said, we were all talking to each other about what we were seeing. We were excited and scared as well, as you can imagine. We could see columns from deck to deck, and on the most upper deck, we could see humanoid figures moving around. We were saying things like, look at that guy. Is he driving that thing or what? And it looked like somebody was shining a light up at it, like the UFO that was seen in China. There was a similar sighting that was seen in Beijing Airport uh, a few years ago. Uh, everything around us seemed to be crackling. I could feel my insides humming. Thinking of it now, I'm really glad that I turned off my truck. Uh, as we were looking at the back of the craft, there were four boxes that were louvered and they shimmered like a road on a hot summer day. The boxes looked like a TV when there's no channels on, black and gray from top to bottom of the craft. Uh, when I worked in aircraft, I was once in the world's largest building in Everett, Washington. Uh, I was an aircraft hater there, and this would not fit in there. The ceiling would have collapsed with all the structures having to be removed to fit it in. The way that I closed this case was, I said witness was to the point lucid. He never diverted from his original interview and his statements. He recounted his experience from memory and never stumbled around in recounting his sighting, as if recalling a remembered incident. A witness has worked for many years as a technician in the aerospace industry, having originally worked in electroplating components in his grandfather's company. Uh, considering the witness's background in aerospace and the witness's composure and the levels of emotion while describing his sighting to me during the four methodical interviews I conducted with him, I believe the witness was describing a, a remembered event that he could not explain. And I close this as an unknown aerial vehicle, a UFO. That's one of my favorite UFO cases. It's just no abduction, no beings, except possibly, you know, and I wonder what, what this was, you know? Could it yeah. have been time travelers? Was that us from the future? You know, I mean, it has kind of a, a human craft look to it, you know, the aircraft carrier thing. Uh, I can kind of see that, you know, in his illustration. But uh, certainly, I don't think it's something that we have now, or if it is, it's quite secretive. <laughs> You know, I've been told time and time again that, you know, the more you do this, the more involved you get with UFO research, you tend to start having those experiences. Like you're somehow, you pop up on their radar somehow, whoever they are. They realize you're interested and, and you're poking around, so they poke back eventually. I haven't had that happen yet. It's a little frightening, depending upon the degree of, of poking that's being done. Um, but I do want to experience that for myself. If anybody out there, you've had an affinity for the things that I've been talking about and you'd like to do this yourself, uh, it's not only very possible, it's, it's pretty easy to do. You just apply yourself, read the book, take the test, and then uh, you start getting cases. And we mentor you at first. You know, we have a mentorship program that we do that kind of gets people up to square when they first join. and. Before you know it, you're going out on cases. 90 to 95% percentage of cases are prosaic objects that people misidentified. But that five to 10% that I can't explain, that's what keeps me going and keeps me doing this day in and day out. I don't foresee a time in my life where I won't be doing this. I, I've got the bug, I love it, and, uh, and you can do it too. And that's kind of the point of it too, is that MUFON's a safe place to submit these reports. You can absolutely do it anonymously if you want. You don't have to give your personal information if you don't want to. 
you can check the box that says, keep my name out of this. Don't contact me. I'm just giving you this information because someone needs it. Absolutely free to do that. You know the old saying, I want to believe. That's me. I think that's really what it's all about in the end. It, it, it seems to be working now because, you know, I've, I've, I've got a team working under me and I've got, uh, you know, speaking engagements and, and I get to tell people about this amazing phenomena, which is like magic, but real, you know? And uh, I love it. I love it. I, I, there's, there's no way I'll ever not be doing this. Mm -hmm.